Today we're going to take a look at organic molecules, and this is going to take us from section 2.4 to 2.8. Last year in chemistry, and this year in chemistry, what we mainly deal with are inorganic molecules. But organic molecules are very important in uh, biology. An organic molecule is a carbon and hydrogen containing compound, and you'll see an example down here of a whole chain of carbon atoms surrounded by hydrogen. Now, it can have other things in it besides just hydrogen and carbon, but that's the basis of an organic molecule. Macromolecules contain many molecules that get joined together, and there are two different words that you need to be familiar with, and these words are monomers and polymers. And just like in um, algebra, mono means one, poly means many. So you're used to monomials and polynomials. And in biology, monomers go together to make up polymers, which are large organic molecules, where monomers are the simple organic molecules. So some examples of polymers on this side are carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. And those polymers are made up of smaller organic molecules called monomers. Monosaccharides make up carbohydrates. Amino acids make up proteins. And nucleic acids are made up by nucleotides. In this picture, this is a meal that uh, would be great to sit down and eat, but um, it has all of the groups, the food groups in it, which include carbs, the lipids, and the proteins. So we have meat with proteins. We have starches, which is a carbohydrate. We have a butter, which is fat. You can go through the whole entire table and find the carbs, the lipids, and the proteins. One thing I want to point out, though, is that while the potato is starch and it's a carbohydrate, the fruit also has fructose in it, which is also a carbohydrate. So it's actually in the same group. Those are both carbohydrates, as is the bread and the cake and the noodles. So we have a lot of carbs on the table. We have a lot of lipids. We know that there are lipids in milk. We know that there are lipids in butter and definitely in uh, the cake portion where we have the butter and the fats. So anywhere you see fats, there's going to be lipids, even on this T-bone steak. The protein is found in milk as well as the steak. All cells, no matter where they come from, have common mechanisms. They use dehydration reactions and hydrolysis reactions. We'll take a look at those. Here is putting two monomers together to make a polymer. So this is a dehydration reaction. In order to put those monomers together, an OH from one combines with an H from another and water is given off. On the other hand, when we break apart monomers, we see that it's a hydrolysis reaction. So water is put in, half of the uh, reaction is going to get the OH, the other half is going to get the hydrogen, and those actually are just split apart into monomers again. We're going to spend the rest of the time looking at the different groups of organic molecules. Let's start with the carbohydrates. A carbohydrate is made up of a monosaccharide. The sugars usually contain three to seven carbon atoms. And one of the things I want you to remember is that anything that ends in OSE when it comes to these compounds is a sugar. So pentose is a five carbon sugar. Hexose is a six carbon sugar. And this is a structural formula of C6H12O6, which is glucose. And you notice that we have six carbons making this up. And this is the same um, representation is just written a little bit differently. You'll notice that organic molecules are written quite differently than inorganic molecules, mainly because of the size of the organic molecules. Okay, so if we take two monosaccharides and we put them together, we end up with a disaccharide. And some examples are maltose, sucrose, and lactose. And maltose is malt sugar. Sucrose is sugar that we're familiar with, like table sugar. Lactose is milk sugar. So this shows that if we go through uh, taking two glucose and we do a dehydration reaction, we will link them together and form a maltose and give off water. We can also have this reaction go the other way and take maltose, go through a hydrolysis reaction where we add water in and end up with two glucose monomers again. Polysaccharides are long polymers and they have many glucose subunits. And one of them that we are most familiar with is known as starch, and this is the way that glucose in plants is uh, stored. Glycogen is how animals store starch. Cellulose is found in plant cell walls. 
So let's look at a representation of each one of these. This is just regular starch in a potato cell. So we have starch granules inside of this cell. And this is what's going on. We have this chains of um, monomers put together to make up starch. And when you look at them, they're quite um, complicated and complex and very large. They can be branched and they can be non-branched. If we look at glycogen, which is how we store starch in our liver, um, you'll notice that there are lots of branching and they're rather large molecules put together. And in plant cells, cellulose is something that we cannot use. And you notice there's no branching. There's straight change of chains of glucose molecules. And these are located within the cell walls of plants. Let's take a look at lipids. Lipids are very diverse. One common characteristic of a fat, though, is that they do not dissolve in water. So there's that hydrophobic again, water fearing. There are different types. We have fats and oils. We have phospholipids, and we have steroids. Okay, let's take a look at fats. Fats are what we normally talk about if they come from an animal. And we know that fats are solid at room temperature. And an example of this would be like if you fixed uh, a roast for dinner, and you first take it out of the crock pot and it's hot and the juices that are around it are hot. And if you let it set at room temperature for very long, you'll notice that the liquid portion will turn white and solid and that's a fat at room temperature that's solid. Oils on the other hand are usually in plant origin, from a plant origin, and they remain liquid at room temperature just like the vegetable oil that you go to buy at the grocery store. Triglycerides are made up of one glycerol and three fatty acid molecules. So here's a glycerol, here's three fatty acid molecules. It goes through a dehydration reaction and makes a fat molecule and it gives off the three waters. A fatty acid is a hydrocarbon chain that ends with the acidic group COOH. Saturated fatty, fatty acids have no double covalent bonds between the carbon atoms and unsaturated have one or more double bonds. So this is, um, showing how an emulsifier works. So if you've ever used like Dawn dishwashing liquid, because you know that when you put fats and oils into water, it's hydrophobic and it's going to just ball up to where you can't even mix it up. You could stir it and stir it, but the fat molecules won't dissolve. So an emulsifier is like putting the Dawn dishwashing liquid in there and it has a polar end, which is going to be water loving and a non-polar end. And remember that like dissolves like, so that emulsifier, the nonpolar end, is going to be attracted to the fat molecule, which is also nonpolar, and it's going to allow those polar heads to be out there and allow the water molecules to surround it and to uh, break up the fat molecules, and they can be then washed away. That's called emulsification and allows them to uh, disperse in water. All right, let's look at lipids a little bit more. We find lipids in cell membranes, and cell membranes, we'll find out, we'll spend quite a bit of time looking at cell membranes in future chapters, and you'll notice that cell membranes are made up of uh, this phospholipid bilayer, is what we call this. Inside the cell, this is hydrophilic, hydrophilic, and the inside of this cell membrane is hydrophobic. So those phospholipids have two fatty acids and a phosphate group. And the primary components of cell membranes is what they're made up of. And they form this spontaneous bilayer because of a hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails. Another group of lipids that you may not think of as lipids are steroids. All of them have a backbone of four fused carbon rings. And we see steroids in cholesterol, testosterone, and estrogen. So this is a picture of testosterone. This is what estrogen looks like. They're very, very similar. Proteins are polymers made up of amino acid monomers. Amino acids have um, specific groups around them. They have an amino group, which is called NH2. They have an acidic group, which is COOH. And they have an R group that varies. So we look at these, and there's 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins that we have. So this is called alanine. And here we see the central carbon atom. We see the acidic group here. We see the H, hydrogen. They all have that. Here's the amino group here. And this is what we call the R group. And in this one, uh, the R group is CH3. 
In this one, the R group is a little bit more branched, but notice it's still in valine, still has the acidic group, the hydrogen, the amino group, and the central carbon atom. Peptides are what make up proteins. So a polypeptide is a single chain of amino acids, and it bonds between two amino acids to form a chain. And here we see an amino acid plus an amino acid in another dehydration reaction. And this peptide bond forms, and it pulls those two amino acids together, and it gives off water. And of course, that is reversible, and you could go through hydrolysis in order to break those amino acids apart. There are different levels of protein organization. Proteins are really complex. A structure of a protein has at least three levels of organization. Some of them have four. And the final shape is very important to its function. Anytime we denature a protein, it loses its structure and it also loses its function, and it's not useful anymore. And a lot of things uh, can contribute to this, but one of them that we're most familiar with is heat or a pH change. An example of when we see a change in heat would be when you have a physical body temperature that goes up above 98.6 degrees, and you running a temperature can cause your proteins to denature. This is just drawings showing you what it looks like for um, an alpha helix, a beta pleated sheet, and how it goes to a tertiary structure and to a quaternary structure sometimes wound around on each other, and adding heat to that will unwind it and cause it to be not the protein that it was meant to be. Nucleic acids are made up of deoxyribonucleic acid and uh, ribonucleic acid. We know that DNA stores genetic information. RNA will find the specific function of it, but it's very necessary for protein um, making of proteins. Both are polymers made up of a nucleotide. And a nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, a pentose sugar, either ribose or deoxyribose, there's that OSC, the sugars again, and nitrogen base. There's one of five different nitrogen bases it can be. DNA is a double helix. There are two strands held together by hydrogen bonds and they complementary base pair. Adenine is always going to pair with thymine and cytosine's complement is always guanine. This is just a picture from your book showing um, how it's put together. Here's a compare and contrast of DNA and RNA, deoxyribose and ribose. The bases are adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, where RNA is adenine, guanine, uracil, and cytosine. DNA is double-stranded, so it does form a helix, and RNA is single-stranded, so it can form no helix. That's just a diagram of what DNA looks like from the ball and stick model, and a drawing, and then the individual nucleotides. RNA is single-stranded, and it has several um, different things that it can do. ATP um, is very necessary, and it undergoes hydrolysis and releases energy when um, things go through chemical reactions, and we consider ATP the energy currency of the cell. ATP is in high energy, and what happens, here's our three phosphates on adenosine triphosphate, and energy is going to be released when a phosphate is released, and it gives off energy. And it forms ADP, and it can be rebuilt because that reaction can be um, switched and, and energy put in to make ATP again. And that concludes the organic molecules, which is uh, the end of this chapter. So now you have plenty of videos to watch to make sure that you get these concepts down.